everyone, and welcome back to this exploration of multivariate data analysis. Today we're going to be considering a very important problem known as classification, and discuss a family of methods known as k-nearest neighbors that are used to classify a point or points. And in particular, what is the k-nearest neighbors algorithm? So what it does is it considers the classifiers of its already classified k-nearest neighbors. So if we look at this particular demonstration, and let's assume that we're working in two-dimensional feature space, so d is equal to 2, and let's assume that we have this point located right here. Let's call this point x. And let's assume that we can only classify it as either an a or a b. So should we classify x as a or b? And how the k-nearest neighbors algorithm works, at least on the surface, is it looks at the k-nearest neighbors, right? So we have a geometrical metric, and we have a number of people that we want to consider. So if we look at this particular picture, and we use just a basic Euclidean distance, it's possible that a is the closest to x. So if we choose k to be equal to 1, so we have total control all over how many neighbors we consider, then x would be classified as a. But the next point that is closest to x is b. So now we have one vote for A and one vote for B. So should we classify it as A or B? Well, we could do a 50-50 split, flip a coin, and then assign it randomly, but that, of course, introduces some noise. And then if we increase K is equal to 3, now we have another B, so maybe we should do a majority vote again and then say that X is equal to B. And then, of course, A is the next closest point. And you're like, okay, well, maybe um, we flip the coin again and then assign it uh, to the value of A or B, dependent on that random event. And we can repeat this process for a variety number of Ks. But in the end, what you should have, unless you're returning a probability vector, is either an A or a b. Okay, so this is pretty much what the k nearest neighbors algorithm or algorithms is going to try to solve. Okay, so what is the very first step that we should do in a k nearest neighbors algorithm? So you might want to pause the video and think about what is the most important thing that you need to do. So most people will argue that the most important thing that you need to do is to decide which feature or features should be considered? A lot of people will agree that that's actually one of the most things um, that you need to answer. So as I demonstrate an example, let's assume that we're either going to be classifying things as either a Y or an N, a yes or a no. And let's assume that this answer is trying to answer the question, does an individual have potential health issues? Does a individual have potential health issues? And obviously, this should reminisce from logistic regression, because what was logistic and multivariate logistic regression associated with it? Well, based upon a particular number of features, what is the probability that a person has something, say, a potential health issue? But that was re returning a probability vector. So technically speaking, you could be using logistic regression to classify, as long as you have some threshold or something to turn that probability into either a yes or a no. Um, but keep in mind that then goes into hypothesis testing. Um, k nearest neighbors is sort of trying to do the same exact thing as, say, classification via logistic regression, right? So let's assume that we have a few feature, uh, features to select from. So let's assume that we have x1 to be age. Let's assume that x2 is equal to weight. And let's assume that x3 is equal to smoking. That's obviously a categorical variable or not, um, obviously that's going to be a continuous variable, that's going to be a continuous variable, that's a dummy variable, but keep in mind we can always do um, some binary coding on this, for example, smoking can be identified as 1, and or not can be identified as 0. Okay, now we have like a pseudo continuous variable um, for x3 as well. So once you have decided on your three or more 
um, features, now we can start um, the potential classification process. Now, just as before with what we did with k-means clustering and principal component analysis, one of the very more important things to do since we're going to be using some geometrical metrics is to standardize all of your numerical continuous features. Usually with dummy variables, we usually do not standardize them. So keep in mind, once you have your x1 and x2, of course, standardize them so you don't have larger distance because of unit types of issues. So obviously, that's going to be equal to xj minus minus the mean of xj all over the associated sample standard deviation, sj. Right? So that's the first thing that you definitely need to do with a k-nearest neighbors algorithm, is to decide what features you have, and then for your numerical features, definitely standardize those features. Okay? So the next question that we need to consider, so step two, and some people will consider this an optional step, is to answer the question, does each feature have the same importance. Does each feature have the same exact importance? Yes, they are all, all important, but are they equally important? Right? So if so, then each feature, and when I say feature, I'm talking about these xj variables, um, is weighted the same. These are going to be weighted the same. And if not, then they will be weighted accordingly. And we'll go into the implementation a little bit later to sort of see how you adjust for different weights for different features. Now, once we have chosen the features that we want to compare for our neighbors, and we have decided the weights, or equal weights, or decided that they should have equal weights for each of those features, now what is the next thing that we need to do? So step three is obviously going to be to choose your metric of choice, right? And there's obviously a, a family of metrics that a lot of people use. Um, the most common family of metrics, in particular delta P, X, Y, is defined to be equal to the P root of the sum from J is equal to one to D. Obviously D is the number of features for each of your um objects, and that's going to be equal to xj minus yj to the power of p. Some people refer to this as a Minkowski p metric, right? And uh, obviously common choices, common choices for p are 1 and 2. Some people will usually call 2 your Euclidean distance between x and p. Now that we have our metric chosen, now we can start calculating k different metrics. All right? So keep in mind, let's assume that we have all of our data points uh, standardized, for example, so everything technically should be centered around zero if done correctly. So let's assume that we have, for example, an A here, an A here, A here, and a couple other A's just sort of floating around here. Let's throw some B's in here as well. So let's assume that there's a B here, B here, B here, a couple B's there, throw a B over there and there. Okay. So let's assume that we're choosing K is equal to three nearest neighbors. And let's assume that this is our focus point. So you need to figure out which are our closest Points. Now, technically speaking, at least from this graph, you might be able to see, okay, maybe those are going to be our nearest points. But generally speaking, since we technically do not know the best value for k, you should be calculating the distance from your point that you're trying to classify to all other points in your already classified data set. And this takes us into step four for our k nearest neighbors algorithm. So now what we need to do is we need to find distances from your point, your point of interest, the point you're trying to classify, to all other points and rank from smallest to largest. Right? That's going to give you your um, closest neighbors to your farthest neighbors. Okay, And what you're going to have here is your point IDs. 
which you're going to change from 1 to m. And then you're going to have your distance metric delta. And then you're going to have the associated classifier for that point. All right. So let's assume that the closest distances are 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.85, 0 0.91, 1.1, 1.2, and 1.8. And keep in mind when you standardize your predictors, um, these numbers are usually going to be relatively more smaller than if you were to keep the original units. Now let's assume that this corresponds to point number 18 in your data set, 12, 3, 7, 21, 14, and 9, so that we know the original data that these distances came from. And obviously, since they're already classified, um, then they're going to have some classifiers associated to them. For example, B, A, B, B, A, A, and A, for example, right? So those are going to be your distances, for example, if N is equal to 7 or more. Now, once you have calculated all of your distances and ranked each of these distances here from least to greatest, now you're going to consider your particular choice of k. For example, let's assume that you chose a k value equal to 4. Then that's going to carry us into the final step of your k nearest neighbors algorithm, which is going to be usually your majority vote, but some people will just return a probability vector here instead of a particular classifier. It really depends what you're trying to aim to do here. So for example, if we choose k is equal to 4, then what do we have here? Well, we obviously have just 1a and 3b's, right? So if we choose a majority vote, then obviously then we're going to return a classifier of b for our unclassified point. Or you could say the probability that it's equal to b based upon its four nearest neighbors is 3 fourths, and the probability of it being a is equal to 1 fourth. That's more of a logistic approach. But note, if we slightly change our value of k, for example, if we change k is equal to 7, that's going to consider all of these points. What are we going to have? So we have 1, 2, 3, 4 values of a's, and we have 1, 2, 3 values of b's. So under this particular value of k, we're going to have a classifier of a. But again, you might want to return a probability vector instead of a classifier, and in this particular case the probability that it's equal to b based upon the seven nearest neighbors is three sevens, and the probability of it being a is going to be equal to four sevens, right? But keep in mind you can also return a probability vector and also a classifier um, if you want in case you don't want to make a very solid deterministic classification um, because that sometimes can lead into a whole boatload of errors later on down in the future. So now that we know the main idea of the k nearest neighbors algorithm, let's cover a small couple of details that you might want to consider if you want to make your k nearest neighbors algorithm a little bit more robust and adaptive to your data. The very first thing that I want to consider is how do we account for weights? So suppose we desire a feature importance definition or distribution for your, let's say, two features to be uh, x1 to be 0.6 and x2 to be 0.4. So we think x1 is a little bit more important than x2. But of course, maybe maybe 0.4 is more important than x1. Um, so make sure you have a correct interpretation of these numbers once you have defined them. So if we have our particular reference point as here, and we're trying to classify it, and let's assume that we have this point A here. Right? So this point here, A, is going to have some change in x. Right, So this is obviously your change in x1, and this would obviously be your change in x2, assuming that x2 and x1 are those particular axes, respectively. So what this does is it multiplies these differentials by those associated weights. So for example, this would be multiplied by 0.6, and this would be multiplied by 0.4 or you can multiply them by their associated complements depending on what you want. So that means when we multiply this by its complement, for example, if, this is, if x1 is more important 
than x2 in terms of our hierarchy of importance, then a complementary perspective will actually be more suitable because we want this distance to be more considered. Therefore, we want that to be closer, but some people will spin that around depending on how you want to sort of interpret these particular definitions, right? So a little bit more of a flexibility here on what you want this to be interpreted as. But nonetheless, your metric that is considering weights under this value of p, and that is going to be a w before you ask, is going to be equal to the pth root of, again, the sum from j is equal to 1 to d. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do our weights here. And then we're going to do the absolute value, and that's going to be multiplied by xj minus yj to the power of p. Right? So that is going to be your weighted metric. And again, some people will look at that as the complement, depending on how you want to sort of interpret uh, how important is this particular thing. Regardless of whether you include the complement there or not, we usually take the convention that the sum from j is equal to 1 to d of these weights is going to be equal to 1 and each of these weights are usually based in the sense of a probability, so each of them should also be between 0 and 1 as well. Right? So again, once you calculate all of your distances, you then want to consider the ones that are closest to you. That is, we're going to rank them again from least to greatest, choose the k closest ones, closer to 0, and then those are going to be the points that you're going to consider for classification of your new point or points. All right. So the next question that I want to consider is actually one of the more important questions of the k nearest neighbors uh, algorithm is the following. So which value of k should we choose? Which value of k should we choose? Right. It's a very important one. Right? So a couple extremes to consider. If we choose a small value of k, this is obviously going to be sensitive to outliers. Right? That, that's an obvious thing, and you should be able to look at a graph and convince yourself of that. And if you have a large values of k, this doesn't account for complex data. That's also the case, right? Because keep in mind, this is just an example of overfitting, right? So we definitely do not want k to be equal to 0. We definitely don't want k to be equal to m. And we definitely don't want k to be near 0 nor m. So we definitely don't want it near the extremes, right? So some easy choices that some very fast methods for k nearest neighbors consider are the following. So let's assume that your sample set is of size n. So let's assume that that is true. Then some choices, let's assume 1. As far as I know, there's no special names for this. Um, you could choose k to be equal to the rounded down version of n divided by 2. Some people will call that the floor. Or you could choose k to be equal to the floor of the square root of m. Right? So both of these are just very fast ways of choosing a value of k. Obviously, n divided by 2 is going to be in the middle of 0 and n, and the square root of n obviously isn't exactly going to be in the middle of uh, 0 and n. For example, if you're on 0 to 9, the square root of 9 will be equal to 3. So that's going to be sort of towards um, the lower end of the spectrum rather than the upper end of the spectrum. And obviously, it doesn't overfit your model, but it's still slightly sensitive to outliers. Um, so although these are both fast, um, these are still not ideal. But they are definitely better than approximately equal to 0 or m. That much is obvious. Right, so if you don't want to get into fancy methods, obviously these two definitely do solve that particular problem. But there is one other method that is a little bit more adaptive, but is of course a little bit more computationally expensive. Expensive. So let's get into that and then briefly explain, you know, how that is going to be implemented. A more robust way of figuring out which value of k you should be using for a k nearest neighbors algorithm is sometimes called cross-validation. Some people also call it k-fold cross-validation. 
So what exactly is cross-validation and how can we use it to figure out which value of k that we need? So the very first thing that you need to do is to take your data set, which I've commonly just abbreviated by s, and partition it into two other data sets. So this is going to be a partition. And we're going to be calling the first set a training data set. And then this is going to be our testing data set. And this is going to be what we are going to classify and also check to see if they have been classified correctly. Because keep in mind, everybody inside of S has already been classified, right? So we're going to be considering the classes for the training set. And then we're going to be pretending that we don't know the classes of our testing set. And then we're going to classify our testing set and then compare to the actual classifiers that our testing set actually has associated with it. Now, what percentage should be our training set and what percentage should be our testing set? And there's several different ways of going about this, but I'm going to give you a little rule of thumb. Uh, let's assume that you're working with a small enough data set. So let's assume that your small data set is, let's say, size M. And that's, of course, subjective and depending on, you know, a bunch of scenarios. And let's assume that this is your large sample size and this is your middle size M. Usually, what we would like for our training set for small n, some people will use an 80% and 20% distribution. And then for our large, usually we go with a 60% and 40%. And then you can go, you know, you can extrapolate in between and say that's going to be 70% and 30%. Uh, it's, it's very obviously clear that if you want to find a good value of k, and you have a large sample size m, this is obviously going to lead to a more robust result. That much is certain. And that's more of a numerical problem to verify. Um, but that's usually the outcome that you're going to see when you use that distribution. Right? So let's assume, for the sake of simplicity, that the size of your testing set, so the size of your testing set, is equal to 10 and the size of your training set is equal to, I don't know, 500, 400, whatever, okay? So how is this cross-validation going to help you figure out um, the value of k that we need to use, right? So we're gonna have 10 points. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, for example. And then we have the yj, for each of those values. So yj is going to be corresponding to class. So I'm trying to keep parallel to sort of what we did with logistic regression, right? So let's assume for the sake of simplicity um, that our classes were a, b, a, a, c, and then a, b, b, c, a. So these are the actual classes associated to these 10 data points from our original sample. And then what we're going to have here is we're going to have our y hat j. These obviously is going to be representing our predicted classes. And we would hope that for the k that we choose, we're going to have a 100% matching to the true classes. Right, so these values are going to be generated, generated for some k and one, two, down to n. And actually, you're not just going to do it for one, you're going to do it for all. And then you see where the computationally expensive things lie. And obviously, the larger value of n, you probably don't want to go from 1 to n. Maybe you just want to go from 10% to n to 90% to n, or some range that you think is appropriate. Right? So let's assume that the predicted classes under k nearest neighbors was a, c, a, b, c. And let's assume this is going to be b, 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 a, a, respectively. Now we need to figure out what is the result of this classification. Is it either going to be a success or a failure? Right, so A to A, that's obviously a success. B to C, that's a failure. A to A, that's a success. A to B, failure. C to C, success. And then what do we have here? We have a failure. 
a success, a another success, a failure, and then finally a success. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to count the number of successes I have here. So I have one, two, three, four, five, and six, and the number of failures I have here is four. And it's very important to note um, that ns plus nf must be equal to the size of your testing set. Right? So from the number of successes to the number of failures, what I want to calculate is a measure known as the accuracy. So the accuracy is just going to be equal to the probability of success, and in this case that's going to be equal to 6 out of 10, which keep in mind is just the number of successes divided by the size of our testing set. And obviously the lack of accuracy or the probability of failure will be equal to 4 out of 10. Right? So we have these two particular metrics. And what exactly, in theory, do we want this PS to be? We would like this to be as close to 1 as possible. And generally speaking, not really close to 1, but as large as possible. So again, we enter an optimization problem. So what you're going to have here is a bunch of PS values that are going to be bounded above by 1, and it's going to be bounded below by 0 because they're just probability metrics. Um, obviously, you're never going to be equal to 1 exactly, uh, at least in the practical realm. So obviously, what you're going to have here is some curve like this, right? So this is the, an ideal curve, ideal curve. You would like to see because what you have here is a curve that has a trivial maximum for ps right so this would be the ideal value um, that you would use right and keep in mind this curve is generated for some value and test or proportion and test. So if you chose a different proportion, it's possible that you get a different curve for this particular case, right? So once you have a particular K that has a very high accuracy that predicts your testing set from your training set, then you can use that particular K to start classifying points that don't already have classifiers associated to them. So this cross-validation method is very, very useful in figuring out which value of k you should be using for your k nearest neighbors algorithm. So those are definitely some of the basics that you need to know when you want to use k nearest neighbors for classification for your multivariate data sets. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.